Our last topic this semester is kinetics and dynamics, and I want to begin with a discussion of transition state theory. So transition state theory is a way to interpret kinetics, and it proceeds from the fundamental postulate shown here that you have a reactant, let's consider it a unimolecular reaction to start, a reactant A that is in equilibrium with something called the activated complex. So there's a rate constant associated with making an activated complex and a rate constant associated with deactivation. And then there is also a forward rate of the activated complex going to products that I'll call B here. And transition state theory says that if you consider that elementary reaction, a unimolecular reaction, A goes to B, which could be monitored as the time disappearance of A is equal to rate constant times the concentration of A. So this is a rate. This is a rate constant. A rate is a rate constant times a concentration. Then the rate constant, K1, can be determined as Boltzmann's constant times temperature divided by Planck's constant times the partition function for the transition state divided by the partition function for the reactant exponential minus the energy difference between the transition state structure and the reactant, all divided by kT. And included in that internal energy U is the zero-point vibrational energy. For a bimolecular reaction, we would have A plus B goes to C. And again, a way to monitor the rate would be the disappearance of A, for example. And of course, incidentally, in both of these reactions, just by, uh, by stoichiometry, the rate of disappearance of A is equal to the rate of appearance of B, and, and the same is true here. That would be equal to K, and I'll, I'll still use a subscript 1 there, uh, times concentration of A, times concentration of B. And here, K1 is KT over H, again, partition function for the transition state, divided by the two partition functions for the individual species. This business here with the superscript zero, this is to make the units work out. So remember that the translational partition function has included in it a standard state volume. So in this particular uh, rate constant expression, if you had worked out all these units, you would have gotten the, the units on the prefactor are per second. Uh, all units cancel out here. This is an exponential of unitless quantities and the rate constant for a unimolecular reaction should be in per seconds. On the other hand, if you didn't see this uh, specification of 1 times 1 divided by 1, but carrying some units, you would not necessarily get the right, uh, the right units associated with the bimolecular rate constant. But this just makes sure that you do that by keeping track of units. All right, uh, and then the difference between the transition state structures, internal energy, and that of the reactants. And so here, just an emphasis that this deals with the standard state. So more generally, uh, we can recognize that when you have E to a minus a potential energy, you can absorb into that exponential all of the exponentials that appear in the partition functions, in which case you go from uh, potential energy or internal energy to free energy. And so this is another way you might see it, kT over H e to the minus delta g double dagger divided by rt. So it's worth noting that in the literature, uh, rate data are often fit in different ways. So there's transition state theory, there's a so-called Eyring plot, and then there's an Arrhenius expression. And so we've just gone through the transition state theory uh, expression that the rate constant is kT on h, e to the minus delta g double dagger. And incidentally, since delta G is uh, delta H minus T delta S, you can uh, substitute that in and recalling that an uh, exponential of a sum or a difference can be an ex a product of exponentials or a ratio. Here's a way to express it separately in enthalpy and entropy. And the reason it might be worth doing this is notice that if I divide both sides by temperature, so I'll have K, the rate constant, divided by temperature on this side, and then I take the logarithm, when I plot log k over t versus 1 over t, well, having taken the logarithm of this side, I'll get the argument of the exponential plus the other argument of the exponential, plus I'll get a, a log of uh, k, k over h. 
this would describe a, a line, so versus 1 over t. So what multiplies 1 over t? That is, what's the slope? It's minus delta h double dagger over r. And what's the intercept? It's this term. And so that constitutes an I-ring plot. When you plot log kt against 1 over t, the slope allows you to extract the enthalpy of activation, and the intercept allows you to extract the entropy of activation. There's another way to fit rate data according to the Arrhenius expression, and this is empirical, really. Uh, Arrhenius developed this a, a long, long time ago, and it still finds use. So the rate constant is equal to some prefactor e to the minus the Arrhenius activation energy divided by rt. And so in this case, what one plots is the log of k, not k over t, but just k versus 1 over t. And if you do that, if you take the log of both sides, you'll see that uh, the expression you'd end up with, the relation between the Arrhenius activation energy and the enthalpy of activation, is that they differ by RT. And the Arrhenius prefactor has hidden within it the entropy of activation as well. So these are related to one another, but it's really quite important when interpreting literature data to be quite certain what was plotted, what was extracted, to be sure you don't say compare uh, inappropriate quantities from transition state theory to, say, Arrhenius theory. So be careful making comparisons. All right, well, I think it's easiest to sort of see this in action, and so I'm going to describe a, a research project that includes some kinetics associated with it. And this project has to do with block copolymers. So what are block copolymers? Well, they are polymers that involve two monomers, but joined together with covalent bonds. And the reason you have to do that is that if you just try to mix two polymers the way you might mix two solutions or, or two liquids to make a solution, polymers tend to like themselves much more than they like other polymers, and you get phase separation. But of course, if you uh, link them together, then they can't phase separate on uh, terribly large scales anyway. They are covalently bound. And there are many, many uses for block copolymers, and I've listed a few of them here. Here's a nice uh, economic boon for Minnesota. 3M Corporation developed post-it notes and that stickiness on the back of a post-it note is a block copolymer. So a challenge becomes how do you synthesize a well-defined block copolymer, that is one that has low polydispersity, which is to say, for instance, that it's a nice series of A's followed by a nice series of B's, and it's always the same number, and it's really very well-defined. So this actually derives from work uh, from Minnesota out of Mark Hillmeyer and Tim Lodge's groups, and they looked at taking an existing block copolymer that was a, uh, where one of the blocks included unsaturation in the polymer. And so, for instance, polyisoprene, polybutadiene, polydimethylbutadiene. So within the block of these polymers, there are double bonds. And what they discovered was if they took this relatively nasty-looking molecule, it's an oxirane with a lot of fluorine, and you heat it up to a certain temperature, the molecule cracks, so if you like, it breaks across these two bonds. It makes difluorocarbene, as well as, um, that would be fluoro, let's see, trifluoroacetyl fluoride, I guess we would call that. Very nasty little molecule. I would want to bubble that through something as it left my uh, hood. But in any case, the difluorocarbene adds across the double bond because it's a nice singlet carbene, and singlet carbenes plus double bonds make cyclopropanes, and you get this difluorocyclopropane. And it's very mild, you just heat it up, it's very selective, nothing else happens with that carbene. It's virtually quantitative, every single double bond gets cyclopropanated, and it's experimentally simple. So that's a, a lovely experimental technique. Well, of course, uh, the property of a fluorinated polymer is that, say, it has non-stick properties, and in general, you might want to have a range of properties available where instead of just having a CF2, you might have a chain of perfluoroalkyl, and you would get more of that perfluoro character in a uh, resulting modified block copolymer. So ideally, what you might want to do then is to make a carbene where instead of just having F and F, you would have perfluoroalkyl chains, and then you would get a cyclopropane with perfluoroalkyl chains. So the question is, might there be concerns about that? <clears throat> and the reason you might expect concerns is that carbenes are well known to rearrange when they are uh, found in a chain, a, a hydrocarbon chain, if you will. So this is not fluorocarbons, this is hydrocarbons. 
But if I start with 2-butility, that would be this molecule, it turns out that there are three rearrangements that can occur. The easiest one to see is when this hydrogen, this one of these red hydrogens, moves from this position to this position. That's a 1-2 hydrogen shift, and it generates a internal butene, 2-butene. Alternatively, the methyl group can also do a 1-2 shift, and that makes this butylidine. And finally, although it's, it's called a 1,3 hydrogen shift, it's, it's easier to think of perhaps as the carbene biting into a CH bond, inserting into a CH bond. And so the original carbon carbene is now connected to the carbon and the hydrogen that used to be connected to each other. And that makes a cyclopropane. And what I want you to notice is the low free energies of activation associated with at least two of these, 5.2 and 8.3 kcals per mole, and somewhat higher for the methyl shift. So what do these mean? What do these free energies of activation mean? Well, let's finally come back to kinetics. So carbene additions, they're typically what are known as diffusion controlled. That is, as soon as a carbene sees a double bond, it reacts. And the rate expression associated with diffusion control tends to be that the rate in moles per second is 10 to the 10th power times the uh, concentration of A times the concentration of B. So uh, this 10 to the 10th then just reflects how quickly things can diffuse through a solution. On the other hand, the unimolecular rearrangement is, I think I said moles per second here, by the way, it should be molar, but that's neither here nor there. The unimolecular rearrangement typically follows a simple rate law. So here's KT on H, roughly, it's about 10 to the 13.4, it might be a little more accurate, I think, but let's go with 10 to the 14th to be conservative, times the concentration of A, times, and here's our expression, exponential negative G double dagger over RT. So what we want to happen here is that the desired reaction, cyclopropanation, is, let's say, 100 times faster than a unimolecular self-destruction reaction that would be associated with a carbene rearrangement. All right, so if the carbene rearranges and makes one of those double bonds, it's, it's never going to add across the block copolymer double bond. So I want the bimolecular rate to exceed the unimolecular rate by about a factor of 100. So I'll just take this divided by this. So I get 10 to the 10th divided by 10 to the 14th. That's 10 to the minus 4th. Concentrations of A cancel out. Concentration of B, that's the concentration of double bond in the block copolymer. And then this is now in the denominator, so the negative sign goes away. So what's the maximum concentration of double bonds I might be able to get? Eh, it's about one molar. And so if you work out what must delta G double dagger B if T is 200 degrees Celsius in order to meet this 100 criteria that 99 times I get reaction and only one time do I self-destruct, I can't have a rearrangement barrier that's lower than 12.9 kcals per mole. But remember that in the hydrocarbon case, not the fluorocarbons, but the hydrocarbons, there were two such rearrangements that were below 12.9 and the methyl shift was pretty close to 12.9. So the hydrocarbon would be a disaster. It would entirely self-destruct. You'd never expect to see cyclopropanation. What about the fluoro case? Well, of course, that's the beauty of uh, theoretical chemistry, is it's trivial to compute the transition state structures and the activation free energies. And what we find is, happily enough, that when you go from uh, the all hydrocarbon case to the fully fluorinated case, now the 1,2 fluorine shift has a delta G double dagger of call it 26, the 1,2 trifluoromethyl is still well above that 12.8 that we were shooting for, and the 1,3 fluorine shift is even higher still. And if, if you want to think about the physical organic chemistry of why is it that these transition state structures are so much higher in energy when these so greenish yellow balls are fluorine instead of little white balls for hydrogen, uh, it's because fluorine is so much more electronegative that it's uh, quite hard for a carbene to sneak into the electrons that are being held tightly by fluorine. Uh, that's just two electronegative things fighting, carbenes against fluorine. But, okay, so that's physical organic chemistry. Let's come back to the kinetics. So that suggests that one thing you might want to do in order to introduce a more fluorinated carbene is you could put a trifluoromethyl species on the epoxide, in which case it can crack this way to make a uh, difluorocarbene, or it could crack this way 
to make a trifluoromethyl fluorocarbene. And actually, of course, this was the substrate used by the experimentalists originally. And I only told you about uh, this pathway, where we make CF2 and it goes on to react. So why is that? Why doesn't it crack the other way? Well, the two transition state structures associated with cracking are 32 kcals per mole, uh, free energy of activation to make CF2, but 46.7 to crack the other way and make difluorophosgene. So that truly is a chemical weapons agent. That would be most unpleasant. But if we were to compute the relative rates for the unimolecular processes, so just plug in this value versus this value and take the ratio, the path on the left is preferred 5 million to 1 at 200 degrees Celsius. So 5 million times it goes this way, only one time does it go this way. And that's why we get only CF2 as a carbene. However, synthetic chemists are, are tricksy people, so certainly the way you would beat this problem is just put a CF3 group on this side too. Then no matter which way it cracks, it always generates the uh, trifluoromethyl fluorocarbene, and you'd have more fluorination in your cyclopropane. So here's that substrate. The only trouble is if you now go and calculate the free energy of activation for this process, here's the transition state structure. It's now up to delta G double dagger equals 52.1 kcals per mole. And so here's the last thing we can do with kinetics. You can actually uh, manipulate the transition state theory expression in order to compute the half-life for a unimolecular process. That is, how much time will it take for half of this molecule to be consumed by this cracking reaction? And the equation turns out to be that the half-life is equal to log 2 times 10 to the minus 14, and again, the actual expression is about 13.4 or so, but we're just rounding things here, times e to the delta G double dagger over RT. Turns out if you plug in 52.1 here and divide by 0.6, which would be appropriate if you're using kcals per mole, then the half-life to crack this is about 317 years at 200 degrees C. And incidentally, just as a, uh, as a sanity test in the actual experimental uh, substrate, which you might recall, we'll just flip back here, had a free energy of activation of 32. If you plug 32 in here, you get a half-life of about five hours. And so, you know, that is certainly an in-the-lab doable reaction, heat it up to 200, leave the mantle on, go take a long lunch, uh, maybe watch a movie, come back, and you'll be ready to work up your reaction. But 317 years, that's kind of a long time to invest in a PhD. So this clearly is not a, a feasible reaction to generate this kind of a carbene, even though if we could generate it, we would expect it to be stable. So other kinds of mechanisms are needed to uh, actually make that species, and we leave that to the talents of the synthetic chemists. All right, well that completes what I want to say about transition state theory and kinetics. Next, we'll take a look at the implications of transition state theory for kinetic isotope effects.